Do you sometimes question your own abilities? And do you have this feeling that it holds you back? Then raise your hand. All right, then this video is for you. Let's dive straight into it. A lot of times we are living the life we are currently living based on the environment we live in. Let me explain. There's this famous fleas in jar experiment. When fleas are placed in a jar, they would easily jump out. But when you put a lid on that jar, eventually, after three days, the fleas stop attempting to escape because they have learned the boundaries of their new environment. Now here comes the interesting part. Even when the lid is removed, the fleas never jump out because they have developed this limiting belief that they won't be able to get out. Now even more interesting is that when these fleas in the jar get baby fleas, these babies will follow the same example as their parents and also never escape the jar. The babies are basically conditioned by their parents to not jump higher than the jar. Interesting, right? Now there can be many valuable lessons taken from this example. But for me, the most important one is that we allow our environment to dictate to us how high we can jump. And often we are not even aware of this. So before you know it, you are living a life based on limited beliefs. Beliefs that maybe aren't making you happy or don't allow you to reach your full potential. Do you ever think you are not smart enough, you are too old or too young or you are not that talented? But how do you know that these beliefs are true? Perhaps you are, without knowing, holding yourself back. I mean, it is pretty simple, man. If you believe you are not capable, this becomes your truth or your reality and you will never try something you may be very good at just because you think you aren't good enough. So who are you, bro? You are just this small YouTuber trying to explain me stuff about limiting beliefs? Let me investigate this stuff, bro. And this is what I found. There's this guy called Albert Bandura who introduced the self-efficacy theory. Now in simple terms, self-efficacy is your belief that you can succeed in a particular situation. So it is not about if you have the skills, but whether you believe that you have what it takes to succeed in a particular situation. Another important point to make is that this thing is a situation specific construct. In other words, you may have high levels of self-efficacy regarding a specific situation and you may have low levels of self-efficacy regarding another situation. Now people with low levels of self-efficacy regarding a certain task often avoid doing that task because they think they can't succeed. And if they do try, they are quick to give up. On the other hand, people with high levels of self-efficacy believe in themselves and feel capable of doing something. And it motivates them to try, take action and go for it even when things get tough. So here comes the interesting part. Imagine that there are two individuals, person A and person B, both interested in applying for a new job opportunity. Person A has low levels of self-efficacy, while person B has high levels of self-efficacy. Now who do you think is more likely to go ahead and apply for the job? You get it? This is the power of self-advocacy. It is the fuel that drives change. But now the most important question, how can we get more of this self-advocacy stuff? Well, the good news is that we can build this stuff. Albert Bandura, the same guy who introduced us to this theory, also developed four sources to build self-advocacy. Now the most effective way to build self-advocacy is simply by experiencing success. For instance, if you have performed well at a given task in the past, then you might feel confident and capable of doing a similar task once more in the future. A great example is David Goggins. Now for those who don't know, David Goggins is an extraordinary man known for his remarkable transformation. From an overweight, struggling individual to a Navy SEAL, ultra endurance athlete and motivational speaker. But when Joe Rogan asked him how he became that guy, he said this. I, I grew up not that guy. Yeah. So a lot of people put a title on me. They want to, uh, they see me now. 
They see me now as the guy that with his shirt off who can do 4,000, 30 pull-ups in 17 hours, who can run 205 miles in 39 hours, who can do all this crazy shit. But what they don't understand is they don't understand the journey that it took me to get to this point. And what got me to this point was I was just the opposite of what I am today. I was that guy who ran away from absolutely everything that I got in front of me. So he didn't became that guy instantly. But somehow, he believed in himself. How I build belief is through the, the daunting tasks I put myself through. So that's proof positive that I can. So it correlates. And that's how this piece of shit kid I once thought I was built belief by saying, hmm, I was in three hell weeks. I went to ranger school. That is proof, motherfucker. So whenever you think Whenever you think you can't, confidence comes from the thing that you built. You must build belief. You must build confidence. It can't be like, hey, um, I'm going to knock that shit out. You got to look over here and say, I can knock that shit out. It's belief and it's built on what you put in to yourself. So this is a great example how you can build self-efficacy by putting in the work and experiencing success. Now the second most important thing to boost self-efficacy is seeing others like ourselves succeed. So observing another person deal with a similar situation and seeing that person succeed can also boost your self-efficacy. It's that feeling of if he or she can do it, I can do it. A great example is when Roger Bannister decided to try to break the world record for running one mile under four minutes. Doctors told him that it was impossible, that his heart might explode, that it simply was physically impossible. Now, despite the discouragement, Bannister decided to try. And on May 6, 1954, he achieved it. He broke the world record and made the impossible possible. Now the most amazing part about this story is that within four years after he broke this world record, 20 more people recorded a mile in under four minutes. So for years, people believed that it was impossible to run a mile under four minutes. But once Roger achieved it, 20 more people achieved it. You see, this is a great example of how witnessing other people succeed can also deeply influence our own beliefs. The third source that shapes self-efficacy is social persuasion. So what other people say about your performance or your ability to perform shapes how you feel about your abilities to handle the challenge. A great example is when Timothy Bradley was fighting this strong opponent and his coach Teddy Atlas gave this powerful pep talk. You ready for the fire? We're firemen. We are firemen! The heat doesn't bother us. We live in the heat. We train in the heat. It tells us that we're ready. We're at home. We're where we're supposed to be. Flames don't intimidate us. What do we do? We control the flames. We control them. We move the flames where we want to. And then we extinguish them. Control the outside. Goosebumps, right? So this is what Joe Rogan said about it. And he's like, are you ready for the fire? The fire's coming. We're firemen. We don't, we don't run away from the fire. We run towards the fire. We live in the fire. And you see Timothy Bradley's like, yes, coach, yes, coach. And he just goes out there and he just stellar performance. Best performance of Timothy Bradley's career. This is a great example of social persuasion to improve self-efficacy and consequently improve our performance. Now, the last source to build self-efficacy is by managing negative emotions. This basically means that your feelings and how your body responds can impact how you approach challenges. To put it simply, if you can stay calm and focused when facing stressful tasks, you are more likely to believe in your own abilities. To illustrate this, think about fighters entering the ring or octagon. It's undeniably very intimidating. The walk to the octagon is petrifying. <laughs> When I am in the locker room, I feel really nervous, to be honest. I am a champ. Making the walk to the curtains, that's probably the most nerve-wracking time. You've got so many different thoughts going through your head, you know, why am I doing this? What did I get myself into? And then they push you forward and uh, you make that walk. 
These athletes excel in controlling their emotions in such situations, which plays a crucial role in building self-efficacy. So you see, these are the four sources to build self-efficacy. Now you may already thought about this, but unfortunately, often the opposite is also true. So if you try something and you fail, or when you see someone like you experiencing a loss or discursing words from people you admire, these things might chip away some of your self-efficacy. So you might think, then I shouldn't try at all because I don't want to lower it. But here's the twist. If you never try, you will never discover your true potential. And remember, failure isn't all bad. It's a great teacher. As the saying goes, the only real failure is the failure to try. And unfortunately, without failure, there's no success. But there's more to the story. Ever heard of practice makes perfect? The more you practice, the more likely you are to improve. So if you fail the first couple of times, this doesn't always mean that you are not good enough. Now, a lot of times we are overthinking stuff. This is simply how our head works, I think. And I made a video about this recently. So if you are also facing this stuff, then I encourage you to watch that video for valuable insights. Now moving forward, remember to build self-efficacy by mastering different challenges. Get inspired by people who've succeeded. Be around those who uplift you and always keep a positive mindset. I see you in the next one. Cheers.